we watch it by Facebook Live, those of us by YouTube, and then we make our mobile app. Uh, we're here at uh, New Jersey. We're here every Sunday at 10 o'clock. Skyline Lakes Fire Department. We're East Coast Church. So if you're in the area, we'd love to see you some Sunday at 10 o'clock here. Last week we were praying about, I mean, we were speaking about how to uh, pray, in, pray in for a move of God. Today we're going to talk about how to pray for a move of God. So last week we were really talking about the importance of prayer in order to have a move of God. Now we're going to pray, I mean, speak today about how to pray for a move of God and how we need to line up with God's motives. When you're praying for God to move in an area in a region uh, that we live in or that we're involved in, our motives must become the motives of God to be successful. Every move of God, every revival that's ever happened uh, has happened because people were in line with God. They were in line with the will of God. They were facing God and hearing from God and what God said to do. Now, the word revival, part of that definition means to put life back into which is into which that which is dead. I've said for years that the body of Christ does not need revival because we're not dead. Mm -hmm. We're alive. What we need is a move of God Amen. across our nation and in our individual towns and cities in the country. We don't need to be revived. For most of us, it's just we need a move of God in this nation today. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone has gone dead spiritually, then they need to be revived. Yes. And that's what the word revival is for. Mm -hmm. But too many times we, we put this in context in the wrong way. So what we're blaming for here at East Coast Church is to see a move of God in Passaic County in the counties around, the region around us. <clears throat> now, we're in Ringwood right now. I don't know if we'll stay in Ringwood, the next facility. We may move out of Ringwood. Uh, it'll depend on wherever that facility is. But it'll be in the region somewhere, in this region. Mm -hmm. uh, but it'll be within the county somewhere. We know that. And we have a big county you're going to see later. But for us, to successfully pray and see God move in the way we want to see him move, then we have to take on his motives, take on his heart. Does that make sense? Yes. And so the number one motive of God is love. Is love. So everything we do in relationship to move God, it, love must be the driving force behind our prayers, behind why we want to see God move, the results of it. Love has to be the driving force behind us as we pray. God saves people, heals people, restores people, and delivers people because he loves people. And we lose sight of that sometimes. Sometimes we lose sight of God's love. You know, a lot of people don't understand the area of healing. And when we've been through as a church, but the motive for God to heal people is because he hates to see people sick. And that's love. God heals people because he loves people. And so if you understand that premise of his love, then his love catches everything. And so we must be people that show the love of God to other people. And at times when people are not lovely, uh, times when we're not lovely, God's still lovely to us. Mm -hmm. So we need to love no matter what happens, no matter what people are doing in our lives, what's going on in our life. We still need to love people. And so love is our motive. Our prayers in praying for the move of God must be prayers that are based in faith, in faith of God's word. We must pray in faith. It means we're praying and believing God's word that we're praying to come to pass. We're believing the words we speak are going to change people's lives, are going to form new des destinations for people, new e places in eternity for people. And so when we pray, it's one thing just to pray, but another thing to pray in faith. So make sure as we pray for our move, God, as you pray, God puts things on your heart that we're praying in faith. And in this time when we're doing this, speaking what God speaks becomes paramount in our prayer life. We must be speaking what God speaks. So how do we know what God's speaking? Well, by praying. You know, as you start to pray, you start getting insight during the time you're praying of what God's saying. And so you need to let God lead you in your prayers. It's one thing to pray from memory, to pray as things come up in your spirit, but also to be let God to lead you how to pray. He suddenly may put on your heart to pray for the children of Ringwood. We need to do that. He can put it on your heart to pray for the children of Haskell or Wanakee. Do that. Whatever he puts on your heart, pray that out. And you'll find as you do that more and more, how you'll find out really how God is leading you by his spirit in all things. And nothing happens in ministry without prayer. So 
So you start praying and more, become more of a prayer warrior. You're going to see more results, you know, more results in your own life, and that's important. Yeah. Obeying what you hear in prayer is really important. Obeying what you hear in prayer is very important. That's how Pastor Kim and I came to New Jersey. Prayer, hearing God speaking prayer, and we moved here, and then later started the church. So we heard all that in prayer, not just one prayer, many prayers, and God confirmed his word to us, not, not that we were looking for confirmation, uh, but he would always bring it to us somehow. To, uh, I don't really like the word confirmation. People start thinking, well, he's got to, i got to get a confirmation from somebody, and you start chasing people for a confirmation. No, 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 no. We hear by the Spirit of God, we speak by the Spirit of God, and we do what the Spirit of God tells us to do. All right? Never seek confirmation. And the reason why you never only seek confirmation, Jesus never taught us to seek confirmation. He taught us to seek him. Are you hearing me? That's the difference. You seek confirmation, you just open the door of the devil, send people across your path, telling you things that they believe from God, and they could be the farthest things from God. These people could be manipulated by the devil to take you away from God. So never seek confirmation. Seek God. If he wants to give you confirmation, he will. I've never waited for a confirmation to obey God. And I know I've heard from God, and, and I know that I know that I know that I've heard from God, and I step out and just do it. And it works. Mm -hmm. So don't seek confirmation. That's his business, and he wants to confirm something to you. You are to hear from God, listen to God, and then obey God. It comes down simply, as I told some pastors at a pastor's conference a year ago, it's easy. We basically initially do two things. We hear and obey. And that's what we need to do as well. And, and how to pray for a move of God here in this area. Our prayers need to be unselfish. We should be willing to, to have our heart break for people that don't know God the way we do. When we see people who are sick, it should, it should break your heart that they're sick, that you want to see them well. When you see people that are crippled up, you want to see them whole. You see people, you know, giving horrible church <clears throat> reports. We don't see those things reversed. Mm -hmm. We don't want anybody going to hell. That should move us to, to pray for people so they're going to heaven with us. So as we're unselfish in our prayer life, that makes a big difference in the impact we have in God's kingdom to see a move of God happen in this area. Also, growing God's kingdom has become our top priority. Mm -hmm. Growing his kingdom, not ours. We're not praying showing you how to pray for a move of God because we want our church to get bigger. It has nothing to do with it. We are praying for a move of God because we want the people in this region to be blessed by God. Amen. We want them to know God the way we know God. Amen. Are you hearing me? It's not to grow our church. I've said this for years. You don't evangelize to grow a church. The churches that evangelize grow. Amen. And we're going to be doing that in our prayer life and, and doing things more quickly in the days ahead. We need to have a heart for hurting unsaved people. Mm. If you have a heart for hurting unsaved people, and then you're out among them doing whatever you do during your normal day, and you run into one, somebody who's not saved and they're hurting, you're more apt to stop, ask if you can pray for them, help them. Uh, you know, most people, when you ask them out in public if you can pray for them, almost nobody will tell you no. And, and I've learned this. I walk up to them, can I pray for you? And if they hesitate at all, thank you, and I start praying. Yeah, right. I don't wait for permission. Because yeah. if, if they don't want prayer, they'll tell you really quick, no, thank you. Yeah. And, I, and I'll, I, will, you know, I will, you know, obey that. They say that. Mm. But if, they, if I don't hear no right away, then I start praying. Amen. And I've had nobody ever tell me, I wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> and I'm talking about me and I'm public. We know with people. And so remember that when you're out among people, we, we should have a heart for hurting people that are unsafe. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of hurting people mm -hmm. out there today. Now, Jesus is our example how to pray for a move of God. He gave us a great example in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. It's so Matthew 6, verse 6 through 15. We're going to read this together. I mean, it's the Lord's Prayer. And people say, uh, that, that shows how, how to pray for a move of God. It does. When I was praying about this message, in my heart I said, what example of prayer are you going to give me that you did? He said, what you all call the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Now let me show it to you as a reader. Verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you've shut the door, pray to your Father who's in, in the secret place. Your Father who sees in secret rewards you openly. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive, our, forgive us our debts, and forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And he goes on these next two verses. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither your Father forgive you your trespasses. So it's interesting. Just look at this. Jesus shows us how to, how to prepare to pray. He tells us to do two things. Number one, go to a private place. So we're talking about individual prayer, not corporate prayer like we'll do here in, church, in the church in a few minutes. But individual, you pray, go to a secret place, a private place. Go to your prayer closet. Now, you don't really have to go into a closet and shut the door. Mm -hmm. But go to a room that's like where you're alone by yourself. There's no distractions. The dog's not going to bother you. The cat's not going to bother you, know, bother you. Your husband, your wife, your kids, whatever. You know, turn the phone off mm -hmm. and 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 go to a place where you can just pray and not be disturbed. That's what this talks about. A place unseen to people, all right, where you and God are just going to commune together. Secondly, he instructs us not to use vain, vain repetitions in prayer. They had a bunch of religious people in their day and time. They'd go out in the public forum and stand on corners and pray real loud to grow a crowd, and, and they kept repeating the same prayer over and over and over again. Got very repetitious. Don't do that. When you're praying out in English, just pray, pray things out. I mean, if you want to take a prayer list in with you, take it in with you. And then uh, you get through your list and let God, you know, uh, expand it, follow him in the prayer life. Particularly, we're talking about how to pray for a move of God in this area. So go into your private place and start praying for God to move in Passaic County. Get specific in Ringwood or the city that you live in. We have a lot of people live in different places besides Ringwood here. So where you live, whether it's Wyckoff, Fairlawn, wherever it is, Haskell, Wanakew, Ringwood, West Milford, pray for God to move in that region. And... Don't use repetition words. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in your prayer. So basically go up in a private place to pray and don't keep repeating your same prayer over and over again. Now let's go through the Lord's Prayer and show you how this is pray for a region, for a move of God. He tells us in the very beginning how to we are to acknowledge where God is and how we reverence his name. Where is God? Heaven. Our Father who is who are in heaven. So we're praying that God, the God of heaven, the God who's in heaven, the God, our Father, where everything starts, Jesus even came from the Father. The Holy Spirit came from the Father. We're praying to the Father. All right? We're praying to the Father in the name of Jesus. And we're reverencing the Father's name. Amen. This is how you pray for God. You have to reverence the Father. Amen. We don't pray to Jesus on this one. He tells us to pray to the Father. Amen. Are you hearing me? In fact, you'll never find a scripture where Jesus told you to pray for him. In his name. He told us he's praying for us. He always points us where? To the Father. Right. Who does he always point us to? The Father. Right. So we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for oh, a move yeah. of God. Amen. Amen. Are you hearing me? So we acknowledge where the Father is, and we acknowledge his name. Now, our desire... And his desire is to see his kingdom to come to the earth. Right, right. That's part of that Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. We're here in the earth. And, and I put in here, in, in the area you live in. So we want to see the kingdom of God come to Ringwood, to Wanakee, to the whole county, to Passaic County. You want God to move us in the entire county. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? We want to see heaven on earth. Remember part of the Lord's Prayer? Remember that? Heaven, so. Go right back to it. You probably know, but you know, my uh, my memory. 
Our Father in heaven, help me name your kingdom come. What your will be done on earth? On what? On earth. So, Lord, we pray your will be done in Ringwood. Your will be done in Wanakew, in Haskell, in Passaic County. Make sense? As it is in heaven. Well, how is it in heaven? Heaven's got streets of gold. Heaven has no darkness, no sickness, no disease. Everything that's needed is in heaven. So we pray for Passaic County, no sickness, no disease, every need met, every dream fulfilled in the people's lives. Amen. Are you hearing me? Do you realize it is possible to live a life and not be sick or diseased? Mm -hmm. To never be sick? Amen. Yeah. That's the greatest testimony of all for a Christian. As a Christian who's never been sick, now he's been sick, it's not a condemnation. Okay? Sometimes it happens. But I'm just saying, you, according to God's word, we can be healthy all the time and not get sick. Amen. So why not pray for that for a reason? This would be the healthiest county in New Jersey, the, health, the healthiest county in New, in the Eastern Seaboard, the most, the wealthiest county. You know, the, the highest economic boom of anywhere in this region. We pray those things in here for a move of God. Uh, this comes up in my spirit. I forgot about this till just now. Years ago, I, I, I would go to a church, a small church in Mina, Arkansas. Everybody say Mina. Mina. And Mina is basically in the south, central part of the state. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. Literally nowhere. A couple hours from Shreveport, uh, but, you know, it's just in the middle of nowhere. And I went and helped this, this small church, these pastors. And they were older. Um, that Pastor Fred went on to be a Lord a few years ago. His wife's taken over the church. And uh, this was 20 some years ago. And I was preaching there one time. And in the middle of my message, I just stopped. And I said this I, I, I saw an open vision. And I said, God has just shown me that He is going to bring economic boom to the city in the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. There's going to be major corporations moving in here. That's going to provide jobs for the whole region. From outside the city of Mina, the whole county is going to come to work here. And so we, you as a church, need to be ready to receive these people that are coming. And so we an influx in the population. And I just went off to that preaching. Pastor called me about nine months later. He said, you won't guess who just announced you are going to build in our city. I said, who? Mm -hmm. He said, Walmart. All right. I said, you know what that means? He said, no, what? Yeah. I said, McDonald's will come right behind them. They'll be across the street from Walmart. Yes. McDonald's follows Walmart. You ever notice that? Mm -hmm. Wherever you see a Walmart, there'll be McDonald's either inside or outside that building in most cases. Mm -hmm. You want to know why that is? McDonald's has noticed years ago, they noticed when Walmart puts a store in, before they put it in, they do a thorough survey demographically of, their eight, of the region they're going into. And they know that if they put a store in that location, whether it will be successful or not. Mm -hmm. And they say more no's than they do yeses in locations. Mm -hmm. And they're so good at what they do that they rarely put a store in that doesn't just go bonkers and go well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they do their research, and McDonald's knows that. So McDonald's <laughs> watch where they start building and actually come in with them and talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. Where are you going next? We want to go with you. And sometimes Walmart will help buy a bigger piece of land, and then McDonald's buy that piece from them, mm -hmm. so they can go with them. Now, McDonald's, you may not know this, they don't make their money on hamburgers. So. They don't make their money on what they sell food-wise. McDonald's is one of the largest corporations of the world in real estate. Mm. They own more real estate than any other corporation. Why? Because they own the land they're on. They don't lease it. Oh. And so their wealth is basically in the real estate that they buy to put their stores in. Most people don't know that. Hmm. But they know it. And that's why they piggyback with Walmart a lot. And so you said Walmart's coming, so McDonald's going to come. And out of all that, there came an influx of tens of thousands of people to a city that was dying and dead economically. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's been thriving. Other, cor other corporations came in behind all those guys. And so what I'm saying to you is there's not a region, including this region in our county, that cannot see change and positive change economically. 
God will do it in order to bring people, brings the people, guess what? Most people don't know God. And so the churches, if they're wise, can be in a position that you see people like that. Are you hearing me? Mm. Now, let's go back here to what he's talking about the Lord's Prayer. So we want to see heaven on earth. We want to acknowledge that our daily provision comes from God. Our daily provision comes from God. Why? Because in heaven, everything they need is provided every day. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Mm-hmm. So if it's provided in heaven every day, it's provided for us every day here as we pray for a move of God. Asking God for forgiveness is really important. He told us that in the prayer that if we don't forgive, God will forgive us. So we want to be very forgiving people. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when the unsaved see us as believers forgiving one another, forgiving people, that speaks to them. Because most people who don't know God, I know I was this way, if you did me wrong, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do you wrong. Called revenge, payback. Mm-hmm. Maybe not right then, but I didn't forget it. You, you wronged me. And Bell was like that besides me. Mm-hmm. Oh, you really just speak with God. Just off your hands. <laughs> we probably all work one time or another, right? When I became born again and got saved, then I, I found that I've got to forgive these people. And I found out how easy it was to forgive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I first had to forgive myself for things mm-hmm. first. So when you ask God for forgiveness, it's really important when we're praying for a move of God. God, forgive people in this region who've pushed you aside. Forgive us for not reaching out enough. And you go through that whole time of prayer. Another thing we do of how to pray is wanting God to lead us is essential to us. We want God to lead us in everything we're doing in our prayers and praying for a move of God. We want what he wants, not what we want. We want to be delivered from evil. Why do we want to be delivered from evil? That's part of the Lord's Prayer. Because if, if you're delivered from evil, that assures you a long life. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Most people don't put those two together. If you've been delivered from evil, if you've been delivered from Satan, that means your life is going to be long and healthy on the earth. Is that true? Because mm-hmm. sickness and disease comes from the devil and not from God. And so if we are healthy, we'll live long on the earth, longer on the earth. We can fulfill our time here, which we want to do. The Bible says you can live 60 to 80 years or until you're satisfied. Well, I've gone past the first number, haven't gone past the second number, but I'm not yet satisfied. How about you? God's kingdom is more important than ours. I've seen this in, for years, for decades, and I see it too much too sometimes in churches where the pastor gets more involved in building his own castle than he does in building the kingdom of God. Or church gets more interested in building their castle, their building, than they do in, in building God's kingdom. At East Coast Church, we're all about building his kingdom first. Amen. His kingdom, not our castle, not uh, our stuff, but building his kingdom. As we build his kingdom, our castle will come. Amen. Amen. Are you hearing me? Our castle will come to build his kingdom. And we know this, that all the power and glory belong to God. Amen. So acknowledge him in all that, in the power and in the glory. Now, after we pray, that, that shows us how to pray. After we pray, he talked then about forgiveness, to forgive people. I, I find that ironic at times that uh, Jesus talks about times after we pray, this comes to the word forgiveness. Why is that? I think sometimes as we pray, prayer can stir things up mm. in the spirit realm. Mm-hmm. And you start stirring things up in the spirit realm, I mean, not only where God lives, but where the devil lives in, that, in his realm. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like Christians praying. Right. And so you got to make an effort to pray. We've all had excuses why we didn't pray. I mean, when Oral Roberts told me one time that he didn't think he prayed enough, I thought fell over off my feet. And I said, you pray more than anybody I ever know. And I, I mean, I knew him fairly well. I mean, he'd go three or four days at the prayer tower and only come out for the bath, bathroom and the water, and that was it. He didn't eat anything. For days he'd pray. I said, how do you think you don't pray enough? He said, Jerry, there's times I just feel like I don't pray enough. I said, there's no hope for me. He said, yeah, there is. He said, just do what I do. Pray more. Set the time aside. If you don't set it, set it aside, it won't come. When I announce I'm going three or four days in that bird tower, you don't know that, why that is. I said, no, why? Because I haven't been praying enough. And if I announce that, I won't be disturbed. I'll lock myself in there. 
And uh, I, I'll, I'll set that aside. And they know unless it's life and death, you don't come get me out of that birth tower. Mm-hmm. He says, so when you, have, when you hear me announce, I'm going in there. I'm announcing, I'm telling the world, I have been praying enough. Well, that kind of took the condemnation off me when he said that. And, you know, we had all I don't know, at times praying enough, including me. So we need to pray more. And when you do, that word forgiveness seems to come up because sometimes it stirs things up. As you pray, sometimes the Holy Spirit will show you things about you that need to be changed. So if he does that, change what he's showing you. Amen. He talks about fasting after we prayed like this. And when you do, anoint your head with oil. Wash your face. It brings humility. And do it in secret. Now, we see Luke talking about anointing with oil and washing your face this way. I believe in their day and time, because their customs, yes. But also this reference is, I believe, a spiritual thing for us today. And that is when... When we God puts you on a fast, if he has put you on a fast, uh, make sure you do it with God's anointing. The oil here, here represents the anointing of God. If you're ever got on instructed by God to fast, then you want God's anointing in the fast. You want his presence and power in the fast. Does that make sense? When I hear people announcing these long-term fasts, I'm never impressed by them. Most of that's flesh. It's really... It's rarely designed by God. And uh, I learned this from a great prophet of God years ago. He said, you know, he said, I do fast on a continual basis, but he said, he said it's not a good fast. I'll fast for one, two, maybe three days at the most. He said, you don't know why? I said, no, why? I find if I try to go longer, I get screwy spiritually. Mm-hmm. And I make the fast bigger than what it really is. He said, fasting is basically clear everything out of you so you can hear from God better. He said, I don't have to do it for 21 days, 28 days, mm-hmm. 30 days, 35, 45 days. I can do it in one or two days. And the whole purpose is to set a time aside, go in your prayer closet, don't come out to eat and drink, and just, and just pray and seek God. Instead of eating during that time, if you eat, you go in that time and pray and seek God. That made more sense to me. And that's why you've never had heard us announce a long time fast. I know a lot of churches believe in the Daniel fast, 21 days. Uh, I have, we've not done that. We have been led to do that. So we do believe fasting at times, but we've got to lead to do that in a way that, that, I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it, but I grew up with six in our house with four kids and me and my wife. Mm-hmm. If I was going to say, we're going to fast for 21 days no. with those four kids, no. it would create chaos no. <clears throat> and kick me out of the house. Mm-hmm. So we learned with them even, we're going to fast tonight's meal and see God. And, and we, we'd fast at lunch or breakfast, mm-hmm. something they could handle. And then it became more powerful when it came to them, something they'd want to do. Mm-hmm. Are you hearing me? Mm-hmm. Sometimes fasting can turn people away from God because of the duration of it. And some people get very strict in it. I don't see God, anywhere in the Bible God's instructing that. All right? So I'm, I'm just saying it to you for your own good, your own health. Treasures. After which he talks about treasures. You done praying, you got to keep your heart checked. That where because he told us, you know, where your treasure is, your, your heart. heart is there also. So if your heart's not for unsaved people, hurting people, then you need to have the heart of God and you need to have that heart changed. How do you change a heart? By changing what you put in the heart. By reading the word. You read the word, you know, faith comes by hearing here by the word of God. When you hear the word, not only does faith come, but also what happens to you, it changes your heart. The word changes you from the inside out. Mm-hmm. Are you hearing me? Mm-hmm. So if I ever see that I'm seemingly having more difficulty with people in my life, it tells me I've not been in the word enough, I get back in the word more, fill up my heart with the word, so when I'm squeezed, what pops out? The word does. Mm-hmm. Not, not the flesh of, not the flesh of uh, Pastor Jerry. Let's see, so treasures, our treasures. Remember, he pointed in this in, in, right after that when he was read from Israel, Treasures are in heaven, not here in the earth. So he's talking about eternal treasures. Mm-hmm. Your treasures in heaven are more important than the treasures are here in the earth. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? I taught this to our kids years ago. And my oldest, Josh, he was probably eight at the time. 
and we had uh, got season tickets in a place called Branson, Missouri. Anybody heard of Branson? And you know, a lot of places in there were shows, country western shows, comedy shows. You have an amusement park called Silver Dollar City. So we bought season tickets to Silver Dollar City. We go three or four times a year. And I was teaching our kids about reaching out to Winston public to unsafe people. So we went in the winter months and uh, couldn't want to see the Christmas stuff. And we stayed in a hotel and had an indoor pool. So we go in the pool. It's me and Josh and, and uh, his other brother, Matthew. And Josh starts swimming with one of the kids. There's another family over there, and they have three kids. We've got four. And she, but it's just me and two of my kids. And Josh starts swimming with one of their kids, about the same age. And I start talking to him. We start swimming together. And we're in there about an hour, hour and a half. And, and my second son, Matthew, he goes back to the room about a half hour into it. And uh, Josh looks at him and said, Dad, I think I'm ready to go back to the room. So OK, let's go. So he got out, got all the way back to the room. He went, Dad. He said, I forgot to do something. I said, what did you forget to do? The young boy, or Johnny, who I was swimming with, yeah. I forgot to tell him about Jesus. Can we go back? Sure. Mm. We go back in. He jumps back in the water, swims over to Johnny. They start swimming together, starts talking to him. And all of a sudden, Johnny and him are on that side of the pool, holding on to the edge. His whole family is right there. Mm. And Joshua leads Johnny in a prayer to, to make Jesus Christ the Lord of his life. He testified to him first mm -hmm. and asked him, do you want to be, and got to a point, after, he, after he, you know, he, he, uh, he shared Jesus with him, would you like to receive Jesus Christ in your heart and be saved? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. He said, pray for me. And the family said, pray for all of us. Amen. So Josh said, pray this after me. Not only Johnny prayed, whole family prayed. Amen. He got a whole family saved wow. by wanting to go back to do but hadn't been finished. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Amen. That's the heart we need to have Amen. towards the unsaved. Is that when we're in the presence, we sense by the Spirit these people probably don't know God, and we're willing to give a testimony, a testimony willing to be led by God to lead them to the Lord. Mm. And, and to make an opportunity for them to know God like we do. And that's important if we're going to have a move of God. It's one thing to pray it, you know how to pray it. It's another thing to walk it out and outside these doors. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? We're praying for a move of God. And God moves on your heart and puts you in place somebody who's unsaved. Part of that move is you then walking out into that and sharing your faith with somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say amen? Amen. Your treasure determines what your heart gravitates to. Your treasure determines what your heart will gravitate to, what your heart will move towards. That's where your treasure is. Mm -hmm. If your treasure becomes people, your heart will gravitate towards people. <clears throat> if your treasure becomes money, your heart will gravitate towards money. Mm -hmm. If your heart gravitates towards love, you'll go towards love. Are you hearing me? So wherever your treasure is, you your heart, it determines where your heart will gravitate to. Mm -hmm. We want our hearts gravitating to unsafe people, to hurting people. Amen. And then lastly, you trust God in every in the area 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 of your life. Trust God in each area of your life. That's what He wants us to do. Now I'm going to give you some demographic information here very quickly. It's a lot of it. As we start this, I'm going to give you some demographics of Passaic County and then of Ringwood. Now, when I do this, what I want you to what I want you to listen for. And look for as I, as I go through this list with you. It's on the notes on the app. It's, it'll be up here. But I want you to look and see where does your heart gravitate to. As we go through the list of things, the demographics of the whole county first. See where your heart lends itself to. Wherever it lends itself to, that's a place, place for you to pray. That's showing God's putting that on your heart to pray for that area of the county. So we're going to the county first, we say county, and then we're going to do Ringwood. Because right now we're, we're, we're here in Ringwood. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the same county, this entire county, 524,000 people live in this county. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a half that's a half million people. I was, I was shocked when I saw that. Ringwood's population is 11,735. There's 190 square miles in Passaic county, 168,000 households. 
120,000 families, 2,800 people per square mile. That's phenomenal, I think, about that one. Now, I'm here to the whole county. The racial makeup is just under 39% are white, just under 10% are African American, just under 6% uh, are Asian, a very small Native American population, and then 42.5% Hispanic or Latino. Mm. So you see the, the largest three races are whites, Hispanics, and then African American in the county itself. This is still talking about the county. 30% of all families have children under the age of 18 in them. 30% have kids under the age of 18. 48% are married couples living together, almost half. 30% have a female householder with no husband. 30% are single moms. 15% have a male with no wife, single dads. Hmm. Which for phenomenal, look these two together. You know, if you combine those two, that's 45% single, parent. single parents in the whole county. That's large. That's really large. Which tells me in our church in the days ahead, if this holds true in the city we're in, because this is countywide, shows us what we have to have eventually in ministry into single parents, both male and female. See, let's go on. 28% are non families, where there's no family, it's just, it's just a person. 47% of the whole county has single individuals living there. 11% people who are living alone over the age of 65. So we're 10% of the population, people by themselves over the age of 65. Average household is 2.93. I still don't know how you, how you do my people, my points, but they do. I, I don't know, Ron, are you at 0.93 or are you, are you a one? A little more than one. You're more than one. <laughs> Average family size is 3.49. 23% are under the age of 18. Yeah, we got a couple of here like that. 9.6% between 18 to 24. 39% between 15 and 44. 15% are 65 years or older. The median age is 37, which means half the people are above that, half below it. 48% are male and 51% are female. Mm -hmm. That's in the count. Mm -hmm. Now, does any of those catch your heart? <laughs> any of those catch your heart? If they did, that's something to pray for, for the county. Now, let's look for a moment here for bring us to a close of the day about Ringwood, our demographics. Over 11,000 people live here. 19.7% under the age of 18. Almost 20% of people here under age of 18. Just under 17% are over 65. So that's higher than the county. 49% are female, 50.3% are male. So about the same. Really racist. Now look at the change in this. 88% white. 1.6 African American, American, uh, Native American, Indian, Asian. 9.2% Hispanic. Remember, before the county was 47 percent Hispanic. Here's only 9%. So it's a predominantly white mm. city. Mm -hmm. This one was caught my eye. 98% have computers present in Ringwood in their home. 98% of all people who live in Ringwood have, have a computer at home. 96% have the internet. So in a town that's not that big, people are connected mm -hmm. to the internet. 96% have a high school graduate, have graduated from high school, have a high school diploma. 48% mm -hmm. have, have a bachelor's degree or higher. So a big drop from high school education college education yeah. over half the people in Greenwood do not have a college education mm -hmm. being household income that means half of them are above it half are below it 130,000 that one surprised me mm -hmm. I thought that was a little high for me but but, uh, but that's, that's that's what the demographics tell us only 1.9 percent of people in Greenwood are in poverty that's low and that's good it's good to see as we went through that being those Twing your heart, and those touch your heart. They didn't find, but they did. That's a place for you to pray. Write that part down and make sure you pray over it. Continue praying pray because God's prompting your heart on these things. These are points for you to pray for. So he just asked you that. What stands out to you from the demographics? We've already done that. 
But what demographic are you being drawn to pray for? And what demographic concerns you? Which one of these demographics, either in Wrangler or the county, brings a concern to you? The biggest one that brings a concern to me, I just mentioned, the single parent families. We have to find a way to have a ministry for them and do things for them. And we're open to that. I just suggested God may give you as well. I've got some things, even as I talk about, kind of rolling around my spirit already, of something we could do in a big way uh, for individual moms and dads. But uh, that, that one that I'll be praying about, because that one was touched in my heart. Are you ready to start praying for Ringwood in our region? Are you ready? We started last week praying. So we're going to pray every Sunday for a while. Uh, 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 are you ready to start praying away from here for Ringwood and for our county? I pray you are. And what God, what does God want to do in our county? What does God want to do in Passaic County where we're at? That is what we have to determine. What does he want to do? And how does he want to do it? How do you just want to reach, in my case, all the single family parents? How do we reach them? How do we reach the children, the nursery babies? How do we reach the impoverished? How do we reach the different races of people? You know, how do we how do we pray in more economic boom to this area? How do we reach people that are uneducated past a high school education? See, these are things to think about. What does God want to do in Ringwood? What does he want to do in, in the city of Ringwood where we're at? I don't know why we're in the city, in, in this in this town, and the surrounding area. Look, we're already as a church that's two and a half years old, are pulling from people from different towns. Uh, we'll continue to do that. No matter where our next location is, we'll continue to pull from different cities, different towns. We will always be known as a regionally based church. We'll be a church for the region, not just for our city. Are you hearing me? And that's why I said, I, someone asked me the other day, one of them, uh, you know, said, I was talking about me and how aggressive we're going to start getting into our next facility. He said, well, what town do town, town you want me located in? I said, the town doesn't matter to me. I want the right facility. I don't care what town it's in. When it's somewhere in the region, but I said, I don't care where it's at. It can be here, it can be in cities around us, it can be a city that's not, not around us, it's in the county. I said, the facility is going to determine where we go. And the facility has to meet certain standards. Plenty of parking, lighted parking. Why light it? So we can have things at night and people can feel safe. Mm -hmm. It has to have space for nursery, mm -hmm. children, youth, young adults, mm -hmm. older and more mature adults, everybody in between. It has to have a place where we can have fellowship, you know, have some lunch and some dinners and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're not looking at a small space, but we're looking at something that's got to meet those basic needs. Right. And when we find that place, then we'll have it. Mm -hmm. Safe. So we know while we're here in Ringwood that ourselves, our question is, what can we do? What does God want to do in Ringwood? What does he want to do this fall in Ringwood and the surrounding area? And what part does East Coast Church have in God's will for, for our area? Hmm. What part does East Coast Church have? For God's will in this area. And the last question is, will you help us reach the area? How many of you are willing to help us reach Amen. this area? Amen. Good. If you're willing, he's willing. So if we're willing and obedient, well, we can do the land as we obey God for what our part is here in this region. In the days ahead, that will include at times partnering with other churches. Uh, I believe God will put the pastor's heart to the church's heart to partner with us in doing things, as well as partnering with them. If they don't, we'll keep going following God regardless. But hopefully we'll see more of that today ahead as well. But remember this. We're here to reach the area for Jesus. That's why we're here. Not just to come in and be selfish and for us to grow into the worst. That's going to happen. But we're here for other people who aren't here. These empty seats that are here, I think, they're going to be filled. Amen. There we feel it. And more seats will be added. No, we feel it. Then that's going to happen. Amen. 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 If you're watching by video, God bless you. Thank you for joining in with us today. Remember this Jesus is Lord. Amen.